If life is a mystery, who done it? Welcome to Ye Gods, I'm Scott Carter. Today you'll hear a conversation of biblical proportions with actress, comedian, author, and producer Yvonne Orji. And because we're both proud members of our writing and performing workers' unions currently on strike, we won't be discussing her film or TV projects. Instead, we will focus on her book, Bamboozled by Jesus, How God Tricked Me Into the Life of My Dreams, now out in paperback. I just read it, and I listened to the audiobook, read by Yvonne herself, whose high-energy performance matches her high-energy prose and her higher-source purpose. Now, I'm someone who's read a lot of celebrity memoirs, some written by friends. This one is different. She doesn't just recount the peaks and valleys in the upward trajectory of her career. She compares her challenges with the biblical stories and parables that inform her life choices. Welcome to Ye Gods, Yvonne Orji. It is a delight to see you and talk to you. I can already feel that this is going to be one of my favorite opportunities to talk about this book. You are a gem and a half already, so... I'm delighted. Well, I'm delighted to to see you and talk to you. And I know after reading the book what you mean by bamboozled. But tell, tell first of all, I've heard a lot of terms for God. There's Yahweh <laughs> and the Almighty and the Creator. But I've never heard sovereign trickster uh, before <laughs> before your book. A sovereign trickster is someone who would do a lot of bamboozling. What do you mean by this term? I mean that he is, I mean, he's a good guy, so he's sovereign in that right. But the trickster is that, like, you know, just kind of like with Joseph, he had a dream. And then Joseph was like, I mean, let me just share with my family. And they were like, let's kill him. (laughs) And so that's exactly how he saw that retelling. But then God says, I can still use that. I can still use that. The joke's on them. What they meant for your evil, guess what? I can turn it around for your good. And so then, even though he gets sold to slavery... He becomes the, I call it the vice president of Egypt, <laughs> the second in command. And, you know, that's how God bamboozles you. That's how he becomes a sovereign trickster. It's like, I'm sure if you would have asked Joseph, he's like, yeah, I can do without the prison sentence. Definitely could do without Potiphar's wife, you know, lying on me. However, <laughs> here we are. And that's how God is a sovereign trickster because he, he makes good on it. And that story occurs all throughout the Bible. Very often someone is, it's like the he, the Joseph Campbell hero journey that someone's called to an adventure and their first instinct is to refuse. This is definitely not a self-help book. It's a get yours book. You started, I think you got the deal for this in 2019 So you, and it came out in hardback in 2021. When you went back, when they decided to do a paperback that's just coming out now, is there anything in this you would change? If you were writing this today, how would it be different? It's so funny because uh, that's a fantastic question, because when it was done, there was a part of me that was transitioning out of my hustle mentality, out of my hustle into more like ease and more like, okay, how do I enjoy life? Because I've been struggling to get to this life that I want to enjoy. Now, how do I sit in the enjoyment of it? And I, there was a part of me that was like, oh, well, am I, am I, is the information in the book outdated? And then I remember my publisher said, no, girl, because there are people who haven't stepped into their hustle season. They're still afraid. They're still, you know, dilly dallying into like how to get to the next level or how to do all the things that they know they're supposed to be doing, but fear or whatever is stopping them. And so she was like, for that reason, it is relevant. And I was like, oh, okay, great. Good to know. The book stands as is, but if there was ever to be an addendum, a second iteration, it is more in the continuation of like, what happens after you receive the blessing? Because that's something that I didn't fully know when I was still writing it. I was still walking into the blessing, but the blessing comes with its own challenges. And I don't think people talk about that enough either. I think that's really interesting. I want to go back to your origin story because I've been seeing you for years talk about being born in Nigeria and then coming here when you were six with your family. And one thing that interests me that I wish that is not in the book but interests me is you would be going back there for annual visits, right? Yeah. You you went back there with your family. And by the way, 
your video from three years ago of Nigerian slang is one of the most <laughs> adorable. I, it is, I've already watched it three times. But how much your African heritage is a part of you? It's, it's a huge part of me. So, you know, my mom was a nurse at Howard University Hospital. So that's how we were able to come to America. But my dad made it a point to be in Nigeria to bring us. So we stayed in America for six years. And then we started going to Nigeria every summer after like when I turned 12. And so that was like a, a good reintroduction into the culture. We would go home. But then it was also, Scott, it was that, that like world a little bit of, Oh, but she's from Yankee. You know, she's Nigerian, but she's from America. And I was just like, mm, ah. but, but then when I'm in America, they're like, she's Nigerian. And like most immigrant kids, like, where do I fit in? But I just remembered one time I was in the village and somebody was talking about me in Igbo because they did not realize that I could speak Igbo. And I remember just being like, well, that's not very nice. And I was like, I'm going to go tell my dad. And I think they were shocked right, that I knew what they were saying. And whereas most kids would probably be like, well, let me just assimilate to America. When I went back to Nigeria and I saw my very eldest brother be able to navigate the markets and different um, people who were in Nigeria because he spoke Pidgin English and he spoke Igbo, I doubled down. I was like, I need to learn how to speak Pidgin English. I need to master the accent. I need to, like, I was just like, I will never come home and be an outsider. You may be like, oh, I, I, I don't sound like you fully or I don't speak it fully, but I will never be an outsider. And I just took that upon myself to make sure that if I'm in America, I can be American. And if I'm in Nigeria, I can be Nigerian. It's not like I don't want to have to choose. I'm both. Um, and so that when you say like how much of that is in me, that's in me. It's like it's where my comedy comes from. It was very important for me even to go back to Nigeria when I was doing my first hour tour. I was like, I want to showcase my country. I want to showcase where I'm from. I have this dual lens. And it's kind of like if you have 20-20 vision and you go to get your eye test and they cover one eye, it's not, it's not complete, you know? So I'm like, I can't just be like, I don't know these people over here. It's like, no, like both of my eyes are open and I want to show you through both lenses. And Yvonne, when you went after then doing a deep dive into the accent and the and the language when you went back the next time were you received differently you know i think there will always be people who want to see you through their own lens there there were people there are people who are like you know hell bent on being like ah she's still she's america she's americanized and it's like well she, I, she's an I, ijgb <laughs> yes an ijgb oh my god Scott, i love you with all of my heart and for those of you who are listening, who's like, what's an IJGB? This is the acronym for I just gone back. Because a lot of times when people like me who live in London or who live in the U.S. or Canada or wherever, when they go back to when they go back to Nigeria, the first thing out of their mind is like, yeah, I just go back from I just go back from. And so they so the Nigerians are like, ah, you know, the I just go back at the IJGB. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but it's so accurate. And when you're growing up, you have a lot of cultural expectations from your family being imposed upon you. So there's a very clear sense of what a good Nigerian girl is supposed to be like and do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, very much so. You know, the good Nigerian girl, she's not supposed to talk back. She's supposed to do everything her parents say. She's supposed to go to church, you know, learn how to cook. Uh, go to school, make straight A's, be a doctor, marry a doctor, have kids by 27. Like, you know, that, there's a whole uh, formula that's written for you. And I was, I was a good Nigerian girl for a little bit, but I think I always bucked against, I always bucked against tradition. There was something in me that knew I was different. I didn't know the term fe feminist or anything like that, but I, what I did know was, if you want me to cook, do my brothers not need to eat? Because why are they not cooking? You know, like, I just was like, how does this work? If we're all going to eat, why are they not also supposed to be in the kitchen? And then because I never got a good answer for it, I was like, well, I guess we're, none of us are going to be in the kitchen. <laughs> like, I just, was, I just bucked against tradition. I was like, I don't, I don't like this label. You also write that when you were growing up, there was something taught you that, that, that martyrdom mm. was a way of life. 
And and so maybe there was going to be a sense of even if you wanted a different path for yourself, it was not going to be permitted or it was not going to be pr- approved if you if you took that journey. I like to say that suffering is the sixth love language of many Nigerians. <laughs> Martyrdom and huh. suffering. It's just like aren't people are like at the service of like no suffering. They we like to suffer ourselves for no reason. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think for me. Obviously, this was 2006 was when I entered the pageant. I graduated in grad school in 2008. I hadn't seen a lot of Nigerian women, especially, kind of deviate and do this thing that I'm trying to do. I had like, I, it didn't exist for me, right? And then I didn't, especially not in America. Nollywood was a kind of a thing, but it wasn't what it is now where people, you know, are, are supportive of it or even Afrobeat. Now it's like, a, it's a whole genre and people are like, ah, yeah, you know, so if, if your son wants to be an Afrobeat singer, you can see, like, the success of the Burner Boys and the Whiskeys and the Davy Doe. For me, my mom literally was like, you want to be a jester? Hey, God of Nazareth. Like, <laughs> she, she was like, what did I do to God to deserve this? Like, she was, she was like, if there was ever weeping and gnashing of teeth, it was Celine Orji and, and Michael Orji. Yeah, and just to be clear to, to everybody... You entered a beauty contest mm-hmm. of Nigerians in America, mm-hmm. and you didn't know that you had to do a talent. Mm-mm. And so when it's presented to you, you've got to decide what your talent is. Comedy, which is not something you'd ever thought about as a career, is what popped up in you that you should do. Yeah, when I tell you I got the shock of my life, I was, I never forget, it was two weeks before the pageant. I just thought, all right, I need to buy a dress. I was like going shopping, trying to buy a swimsuit because I was like, oh, swimsuit competition, dr- formal dress, et cetera. And, you know, I watched a couple of pageants on TV. So I was like, oh, let me make sure that I have an answer for a final question or whatever. And two weeks before they called and they were like, what's your talent? I was like, is this not the Nigerian American project? We don't have talents, uh, extracurricular activities. No, like all of our extracurricular activities either need to be financial <laughs> gains in some way, shape, or form, or helping us to get into med school. And so they were like, yeah, but everyone who competes needs to have a talent. And I was like, what the, what in the world? And so I remember praying, because at this point, I got saved in 2001 when I entered college. And so now it's 2006. So I'm like, all right, God, I'm five years in. Hey, how are you? You've helped me through college. So I hear that you can do other things than help a starving college student get pizza. Um, (laughs) What am I supposed to do? And I hear loud as day, the voice of Holy Spirit, like, I'm literally like, God, I need something. I don't want to be embarrassed. I've already sold tickets. I can't back out. Because I also had a fear of, like, being embarrassed or bringing shame (laughs) on my family or my name. And he said, loud, I heard Holy Spirit so distinctively. And it was two words. Do comedy. Wasn't even a full sentence. Just do comedy. And I was like, wait, what? And one thing I know about me when I hear the voice, people are like, how do you know it's God? How do you know it's Holy Spirit? Because oftentimes it's something I don't want to do. <laughs> it's something I don't. When, when I hear it loud and clear, especially, and if, if it frightens me, if it scares me, and my heart starts beating, I'm like, why is he stretching me again? Because it's not something I want to do. The things I want to do, I just do them. I just do them and I'm like, God, you're good. Like, it's like he gives me the green light. Like, there's no, I don't say there's no checking in because you still have to check in with him. But for the most part, the feeling is different. The stuff that has been the most purposeful has been the stuff that I'm like, oh, he wants me to do the most ridiculous stuff. It's like, I feel like how Gideon felt when he was like, now I know you have 300 people fighting with you. Yeah. Also, don't use weapons. Just blow the trumpet. <laughs> like, I was like, I already didn't want to fight. I already didn't want to do this. Let's go back to this conversion experience that you have. And I love the way that you tell this because you're a freshman at George Washington University. You're 17. Mm -hmm. And your plan at the time is you're three months short of your 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. And then you're going out one night to a party with a girlfriend. And she says, what about before we go to the party, let's go to this Bible study. So you're all... You're all dressed up. It's like the Van Morrison song, <laughs> Wild Night Calling. It's a wild night calling, but you go to the Bible class first, mm-hmm. and then you see this woman. She's surrendered her life to God, and you ask the question, and I love this phrasing, was the love of God that she spoke of 
the acceptance I'd been searching for this whole time. Yeah. No, that was, it was because, you know, when you meet someone and what they are offering is so palpable, like, or even like if you meet someone who's like, I just had the best meal. Whenever you go to London, make sure you go to this place. It is, if you do nothing else in your trip, go. And so you're like, I'm so when I, when I touch down in London, I got to go to this place because everyone keeps talking about it. And that's kind of what this felt like. It was like, wait, like, I, I thought I loved, I thought I loved God. I mean, I got to church. I grew up Catholic. Like, I mean, he's cool, but I guess I don't really love him like she loves him. Like, she loves him, you know? <laughs> and that was a thing where if ever I got competitive, I, I, I didn't want to feel left out. I went in on that. And that's kind of like, you know, what the book is all about. It's like, that's why I say it's, it's a get yours. It's like, I want you to be like, wait, I want, it, I want in on that. I want, I want to end on those blessings. I want, I want to end on this life that could feel hard, but at the end of it, like God shows me the best version of myself. I want, I want to end on that. And that's how I felt. And it, again, I was also 17 years old. I've been bullied as a kid. I still didn't really feel like I belonged and not just culturally, but just like to myself. Like I always felt like an outsider. I felt like an outsider in my family. I felt like a project around friends. I didn't, I, like, I just was, tossed to and fro. I was like, whoever you want me to be, let me know. And I can be that if that means that you like me, you know what I mean? Because my, my self-esteem was so shattered. And so for her to just stand as a 26 year old, so sure of herself and her convictions, I was like, man, what, what do I have to do to get there in my life? And I want to do it. I'm willing to do whatever it is because I, I can I always knew God that something, something wasn't right. You know, like I, I, I didn't feel easy. I didn't feel totally wanted and it was so interesting about what Lindsay offered and how I took it was the thing that most people find very difficult about faith and religion and following God is the thing that comes so easy to me and that's not to brag but it for me faith was very I would say plug and chug but it made the most sense in my life this is the book this is what his desire for you is follow it as best as possible and through your obedience, you unlock these things. I was like, what are people complaining about? This feels like, this is amazing. Because at that point in my life, I didn't understand people because people were so fickle. People would say, you're my best friend. And the next day they're beating me up at the bus stop. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what, what, what changed? What happened? And I couldn't understand the irrationality <laughs> and the unpredictability of humans. But the predictability and the rationality of faith. I'm like, sure. And what's so funny is now, if you again going back to that beautiful question you asked me earlier, of uh, what would what change, what would change if you had to write this book again now? At the start of was it last year and double down this year, Holy Spirit said, um, I need you to trust you like you trust me. And I was like, Well, why do you want to do that, God? We have such a good thing going on. I don't want to, I don't want to rely on me. I was, I, what if I, what if I get it wrong? You know? And he's like, we're elevating our relationship. It's not just do what I say, do what I say. I want you to know that because I live in you, there is no getting it wrong, but you have to trust that I'm in you in order to make the decisions that you feel are best for you. And I was like, oh, again, going back to the unpredictability thing. Uh, Cause it's so much easier. It's like, I just did what God told me. <laughs> And when you woke up the next morning, was this resolution still as strong in you? Or was there ever a sense of hangover or, wait a minute, what did I pledge last night? I mean, it's one of those things, it's kind of like every new Christian. <laughs> when you become a new Christian, it's kind of like there's a veil that's lifted. Your eyes are like, <gasps> oh my God, this is awesome. Like for me, I was like, I'm looking forward to next week because it was a weekly Bible study. And this is still, this is still, you graduate from college, this is still, you haven't found comedy yet, mm -mm. but you know you don't want to do medicine. Yeah. Yes. And you went to Liberia? Yes. For, with a not-for-profit? Not I got my master's in public health, and then after I did that, my mom was like, great, now med school? And I was like, mm-mm, I got to put into practice what I just got my degree in. So Liberia had just finished a civil war. And it felt more comfortable <laughs> to go 
to Liberia. Now, mind you, this is 2008. So I had done the pageant. I've been doing comedy around D.C. and Maryland. And my mom was like, it's okay. You need hobbies to add as extracurricular activities when you apply for medical school. So in her mind, it was a hobby. In my mind, I was like, okay, God, I need, I need some distance to, to get a game plan. And so going to Liberia was a distance uh, and the stalling tactic. <laughs> yeah, and in, in a way, the family or friends maybe at the time that, that you were at some point going to have to honor this calling that you'd felt mm -hmm. versus what your parents were expecting of you. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's always hard because, again, I just found God five seconds ago. But my mama was the one who left a whole country, her whole family, to come to make sure that we had a good education. She sacrificed even when we got here. So now you're like, it's not just an arbitrary somebody I'm going to disappoint. It's her. <laughs> it's them. It's my father. You know, it's, it's like these are the people without whom there would be no GWs. You know, there would be no opportunities. And so now you're saying, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, because of it, I'm going to not do what you want me to do. <laughs> you know, it's a, little, it's a little bit more difficult than just like some random boy. Um, mm. But at the same time, I was like, but then there's the God element. So who trumps who? Like who trumps, does God trump my parents? He has to, right? So I kind of was just like vacillating, you know? And then at some point I, I was like, hey God, I gotta believe that you knew the kind of parents I was gonna be born into because you, 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 you made them happen too. So it's above me now. I, I, I really am not able to manage their disappointment and manage your expectation for me. So I'm gonna just focus on you and I hope you get them. <laughs> like I, they had to, like I had to cut the ties at some point. It was very hard, but I was just like, I cannot do both. And one of the things I admire that you describe how much impact God and religion have on your life. And yet you are one of the most proactive people I have ever met. You are always coming up with new things. So one of the things you start doing is hosting your own comedy shows. Yes. Yes. Which which I know other people who went that route who would find a restaurant or someplace that would let them do comedy one night and they would become a booker and and then it was a way to meet people. It's a way to network. It's a way to have people to collaborate with. It is that's a, such a strong thing to do. Yeah. Well, Scott, faith without worse than that, right? It's like, I can believe all day long that like, this is what God wants me to do. And this is what God has for me. But at some point I got to I got to get going. I got to, I got to like put into practice some, some practical things. And if I'm just sitting, cause I think a lot of people are like, well, when the way is made clear and it's like, Oh, Oh, that's, that's cute. When will that be? Cause I, I, I haven't been <laughs> just sitting and the way made got made clear. I've, I put on my shoes and the way and the way got made clear. I I started walking, you know, but I've just not been in my house kicking it and not thinking about the way at all. And I think that's the difference. So when you say like, you know, God is at the center, but you are so proactive, it's like you you have to do both. There are times when God will sit you down and be like, I ain't tell you to do nothing at all. And it's like, what? Like even when the book first came out, I was devastated because I was like, Lord. The, the pandemic pushed things. And so it's coming out during the final season of the show that I was on. And I was like, I want this to be successful. I want to like promote it everywhere. But if I do, I will literally crumble and break. I have, there's no other part of me that can even do a promotion. I'm on set 14 hours a day. It's grueling. This is the most exhaustive schedule we've ever had. Oh my God. God, am I, am I going to let this book not be successful and God was like well what's successful to you because what was successful to me was that you wrote it and I was like oh yeah, um, yeah but I don't want to just write it God I want to write it I want to make the New York Times sellers list I want to do numbers I want to prove people wrong I want to like glorify your name and I want to sell like millions and he's like yeah, that's, that's what you want to do that's, that's, that's not at all what I had said out I was like well what's the point it's like you know the Nigerian in me definitely 
We're like, well, what the heck is the point, God? If what we do doesn't get catapulted into the most major stage, then why are we doing it? He was like, oh, okay, so this is the next lesson for you to learn. Now, when this voice, do you go to a certain place to ask for the... Do you go up to Mount Sinai? <laughs> do you have your own personal Mount Sinai where you... where you, where, or, or is it... There is, can it happen at any time of your day at home or in the car right now? It's usually when I take the time to be still because oftentimes I'm not still. Like you said, I'm always going. So still means like I'm actually journaling. Now still means I'm taking a bath. Oh, when I tell you, it, it's like God has been holding his breath and he's like, finally, she's still, she's in water. All right. Let's talk about her because she's been ripping and running and acting like I don't exist. So in, in the water and bath, or when I take time to write in my journal, but at this point, at that point in my life, it was, it was more frequent because one, I was, I was, all I had to be was home. I wasn't working. I was poor. And all I had at that time was just me and God. So we kind of had that like constant communication. Like the doors were always open because it's like I was just at home. <laughs> I didn't have cable. <laughs> I don't think I had cable. Like I, like you know, I was. Just, it was very lean struggle days. And so everything kind of had to go through the God lens, right? I'm like, God, what you think we should do today? Oh, you got what? You know, God, what, what should I eat? Do I even? Um, okay. Like I was asking every. Like I would invite him into every aspect of my life, and I think he knew. There's going to be a season when this relationship won't be as uh, fluid. So let me get her now. Let me set the foundation now because she's, the blessings will come and she will always know me. But this, this um, beautiful exchange that we have now won't look the same. You also had a lot of discouragement in your career early on. And you would talk about being depressed. I can't imagine you low energy. I can't imagine you lying down and just letting the world um, immobilize you. When I tell you it's not a pretty sight, it's not a pretty sight. I don't recommend it. I don't like getting there because it's not sexy. It's not. Depression isn't sexy. <laughs> um, but it is that thing of I seldom get there. That's why when I do, it knocks me on my back. It knocks, and when I tell you, Scott, it knocks me on my back because I'm so, like, I am the kind of person, like, you told me no, oh my God, I get activated. Like, what? No. <laughs> Hold on, stay right there. I'm going to come back when it says yes. And I'm like, this is now, it's like the Lazarus, the Lazarus in me. I'm like, God, this is your moment to be glorified. Like, your name is on the line, sir. You bet. Like, it's almost like, oh, I feel like people are like, we should have just told her yes. Because she's now, she, now she's annoying. But uh, I, when you go through all the uh, options, you go through every avenue that you can think of, and you come out with nada, oh, yeah, Scott, that, it, 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 it cripples me. It cripples me in a way where I'm like, well, God, I don't know what to do. I, like, I, I really thought, I thought this was for you. I thought you wanted this. Maybe you don't. So what's the lesson here, sir? You know, now I get, I get mad. I get upset. There are a couple of such poignant stories in the book. One of them is you're 25 years old. Mm -hmm. You have a master's degree. Yeah. But you find yourself scrounging around your apartment for loose change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you write, warm tears start rolling down my cheeks. And then you have an experience. Yeah where you say that God started downloading to you promises and it becomes this kind of blueprint that you write down. You've still got it tucked into, yeah. into the Bible you've had since you were in college. Mm -hmm. There is something magical that happens in these two instances. And when this time when you wake up, your roommate has made breakfast for you. Yeah, that was a very pivotal. I just got back from Liberia and even that was a blessing. Like I there's so many things that are connected. And sometimes in real time, you can be like, God, how the heck did you put two and two together to equal eight? What? And then sometimes you don't see how they connected until like, you know, two, three, four years from that, from that moment. But I met this woman, Jackie Corey, the last weekend I was in Liberia. So then again, it's just like, I was supposed to go to Liberia. Like you may be, you may think you were running, but God was like, Yes, you can call it running, but I've also 
put somebody there who is going to be so enamored by you randomly because you will remind her of your, her daughter and you will meet her once. And <laughs> three months after that meeting, you will write a post on Facebook talking about how you're moving to New York. She will see Fed Post and invite you to live rent-free in her home for six months. It's like that's legitimately what that was, right? So I'm living rent-free in the basement apartment that she um, had set up for her daughter, but at this point her daughter is away at college. And I wanted to go into Midtown because they lived in Queens. I wanted to go into Midtown Manhattan to get cheese, two slices of cheese pizza and a, uh, and a uh, Phantom because that was $2.75. I was like, ooh. If I can just get $2.75 plus the $1.25 to get on the subway, I'm in the money. I can have dinner. And I came up so short. I was like, God, I don't even have $7. I don't have $7 to my name. I have two degrees, student loans, a family who loves me. And I have less than $7 to my name. And then I remember I was sitting in the bed. I was crying. And I got a pen. And when I tell you, this is a blueprint. I said, and now it's framed. It's no longer in my Bible. It's framed. And he gives me such a lofty, like, you know, when someone pours into you so much, you're like, baby, but I can't receive it. I'm just hungry. But I was like, I want to receive it, God, but you're giving me too much. And this is why when people were like, well, why, why doesn't just God tell you everything before you go? Because you wouldn't even believe it. Because you wouldn't go. Because you would be like, that's, that's a lot. I don't even want that, that pressure. And so it's kind of like you get mad because he doesn't give you enough. And then you get mad when he does give you too much. And so I just was like, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to write it down because I do have to believe that he wants more for me. And this more is the best for me. But I'm also kind of like, but God, why would you give me all of this and not the basic? Like, I, I love that you're a guy that can see past my present circumstances. But I also need you to be a God in my present circumstances because I'm poor and I'm hungry. And I, you know, I say in the book, uh, a quote I heard from Christine Kane, you have to outlast your darkest day by one night. And so I, I, I went to sleep hungry. And when I tell you, baby, I woke up, it was pancakes, eggs, bacon. I said, did the Lord speak to her in her sleep? Because I know this is for her family, but this was for me. I, this was an answer prayer for me. And it was just like I went to sleep hungry and I woke up full. Just so full in more ways than one. The other thing about this, and you talk about being having a master's degree, and yet you're trying to scrounge for money to get something to eat, and uh, yeah, and you're pissed at God, <laughs> and you and you give him an ultimatum. You tell him that he sold you dreams that felt now more like horrible nightmares. I recommend getting pissed at God every so often. I do. I recommend because I recommend being honest right? It's kind of like David was honest. David was like, listen, I know I messed up, but what good is there in my, in, in my, in my demise? If I die, who going to praise you? Like, I feel like we have to get accustomed to being honest, right? And God is always going to be honest with you because in this moment when I was like, God, it's your fault. I'm over here. I've been trying. It's 2014. Like you said, everybody that I graduated with is getting married. They're having babies. What do I have to show for my life? What do I have to show for my obedience? So that's when when we talk about God's timing being, you know, God, like, it's perfect. Like, it's not too early. It's not too late. It's because it's not about you. You you are correct. You are ready. You are ready to get married. You are ready to have a baby. You are you are absolutely a thousand percent correct. Every The environment is not ready for your readiness. <laughs> so everything has to conspire for that. And so I was pissed. I'm yelling at God and I'm like, this is some trash. You know what? I am going to make that call to mom and dad. And tell them I apologize because at this point there was no ego. I said, listen, I too want to be the good Nigerian girl. So anyway, I'm on the street. I'm crying. I'm like, God, I guess this is what you want for me. But you win, I guess. They win. I don't know who wins, but I'm losing. And Holy Spirit says, what's in your hand? Baby, when I tell you I almost cussed God out, have you almost cussed Jesus out? I was like, I don't want to hear you. I'm actually sick and tired of your voice coming through. Stop talking to me. This is a one-sided conversation, and it, it requires me to just be mad at you. And I was like, what do you mean what's in, in your hand? And he was like, I gave you something that you have done nothing with. And I was like, what? And you know that moment where you're like, are they right? Is God right? He is. And so, I, like, to your point, I went to bed after I cried for, like, three miles. I went to bed, and I woke up, and I was like, let me grab my Bible. 
And I, I got to the scripture, Psalms 31, 14 and 15. It says, I will yet trust you because my times are in your hands. And it's so funny because I just recently heard a sermon by Dr. Darius Daniels of Chain Church, and he talked about impatience. And he says, impatience comes into play when you believe that time is being wasted, when you believe that it's too late. And so then you kind of trick it off and then you act impulsively. And in this season, in this moment, this was 24, this was 2014, going into 2015, I was almost 30. I was like, God, first of all, when I got saved at 17, I did not think that almost 15 years later, I would have nothing to show for myself. I would be not married. I would not have kids. I would not have money. You know, so it's just like, you're impatient. It's like, literally a year from that moment, because this was October 2014. By October 2015, I had met Oprah. We were developing a show with David Yellowwell. I had booked <laughs> my very first TV regular role. I had paid off my debts like a Lannister. Like in one year, God took me from crying on Sunset Boulevard to a show that I was currently starring in, having a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. You know, it was it's one of those like, oh yeah, okay, God, thank you for not letting me give up. <laughs> it's so rewarding to the reader when you become successful <laughs> because we've seen all that you have gone through. Mm. And when success came to you, how was it different from how you thought your life would be? You know what? It was one of those things where I thought success would be like, oh, you're just like you're a working actor. I did not see God being like, let me catapult you in this culture record breaking show that if I land in London, people know my name. If I you know, go to South Africa, people don't want it. So like, that's what it, that's the difference. I was like, what? Like, God, you make good on that same time that I wrote down in that woman's basement apartment in 2009. Like, this is the, this is it. And you wouldn't let me accept anything less than this. And so success looked different because it was bigger than I could have ever imagined for myself. But then that's the scripture, right? He will do the exceedingly abundantly above all that you can everything dream, ask for, or imagine. And that is literally what he has done and continues to do in my life. Yvonne, you have been so generous with your time, so generous with your energy. Let me just ask you two very quick questions that I ask everybody at the end. Do you have a, a, a work of art or uh, uh, a song, a movie, something that you wish everybody could experience because you think their life would be better for it? One thing that kept me going on my journey, there's this song called, Am I Wrong? <laughs> and it goes like, am I wrong for thinking about, like, I can't sing, I don't know why I tried, but it's called Am I Wrong by Nico and James. And basically it's asking me all the questions like, am I wrong for trying to have a dream? Am I wrong for believing that more is available? And it's just like, you know, sometimes I felt like, is it so bad to have lofty dreams? Is it so bad to be, you know, um, the first one in your family to do something is like, yes, there's no blueprint for this, but what if I am the blueprint, you know? And so there is that. And then there's another song by Sugarland, like, dear mom and dad, please send money. I'm so broke, it ain't funny. But it's called Baby Girl. And then at the end of the song, it goes, dear mom and dad, here's some money. I'm so rich, it ain't funny. So it's like, it just turns, it's a country song. But it was just that thing of like, I, I'm, I'm big on hope. I'm big on vision boards. I'm big on like, how do I have this moment of hope? And so those are the songs that like, I was like, one day I want to sing these lyrics and they're going to be my life and not just aspiration. <laughs> and then the last thing is out of all the different Bible quotes that have provided you comfort, is there one that you keep coming back to? Blessed is she who believes that what the Lord said about her would be accomplished. That is, that is the one. Yvonne Orji, <laughs> I am so delighted to talk to you. Thank you so much. Bye, Scott. And now for my sermonette in my homily opinion. I think that conversation with Yvonne is the deepest we've ever gone into any guest's bio. Despite lean years and alienation from her family and heritage by deviating from their expectations, working for two college degrees and a vow of chastity, the God she'd prayed to for 15 years finally delivered on almost all of her wishes. 
But I also know other talented artists who I perceive to be as devout as Yvonne, whose prayers of stardom were never answered. So spiritually, what gives? Maybe Yvonne tried harder. Maybe Yvonne is more gifted. Maybe success in showbiz isn't God's plan for everyone. Can God love you and still leave your prayers unanswered? Or, if you really believe in God, don't all earthly goals pale beside the reward that you believe awaits you in the great beyond? Yvonne thinks that when she seeks God's rewards in her own way, in her own time, she often fails. But when she tries God's tougher path in his more circuitous time, she succeeds. And one last thing. I I know that the research I do before interviewing each guest makes me see, for a while at least, the world through their eyes, like I'm an actor preparing for a role based on a real person. And I find that, as I consider our guests' opinions, my own opinions get re-examined. Maybe that sort of thing is happening for you as well. So that's our show. If you've had prayers go unanswered, maybe you're a New York sports fan, email us at yegodspodcast at gmail.com or visit us on social media at yegodspodcast. If you like the show, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you didn't like it, please try one more episode. And then, if you didn't like that, okay, fine, then uh, maybe this podcast is not your cup of communion wine. I want to thank all ye gods and goddesses who let there be light on this show. Dossie McCraw, Robin Rose Valentine, Selena Lauterer, and her team of ladies at Artemis Independent. I'm Scott Carter. And until next time, be of good cheer.